Good morning. morning. It's good to see you as we're gathered here to worship our great God uh, on this uh, Palm Sunday. I'm wearing my uh, royal purple bow tie in light of uh, Palm Sunday, in case you're wondering why I'm wearing purple today. Uh, That would be why. Uh, If you are visiting with us, we extend a warm welcome uh, to you. Glad that you can uh, be here to worship with us. Uh, Our God uh, calls us to worship this morning with Psalm 117, so I invite you to stand for our call to worship. Praise the Lord, all nations. all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us worship God. God in prayer. Now, great God and Almighty Father, we do lift up our voices in praise to you. And we give all glory, laud, and honor to your Son and our Savior, the Redeemer King, the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you thanks, O God, uh, that He has, uh, he has uh, been enthroned as our King and as our Lord. We give you thanks, O God, that by your Spirit that you have poured forth upon us, we may lift up our voices, for we confess and acknowledge that if we closed our lips, the very creation would redound to the glory of his great name. Now, as we are gathered as his body, we pray, O God, that you would indwell us, that you would powerfully move among us and even in us as your word is declared, as your glory is made known. And we pray that you, O God, would speak to us by the power of your word uh, through the name of your Son and our Savior, in whose name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. This morning we affirm our faith, uh, affirming the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the mediator uh, of a new covenant, uh, and uh, through uh, the sending of his Spirit, Uh, joins us uh, into this covenant that we might then uh, proclaim uh, that he is our Redeemer King. And so I ask you, what do you believe? It pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, his only begotten Son, to be the mediator between God and man, the prophet, priest, and king, the head and savior of his church, 
the heir of all things, and judge of the world, unto whom he did from all eternity give a people to be his seed, and to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. To all those for whom Christ has purchased redemption, he does certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same, making intercession for them, and revealing unto them, in and by the word, the mysteries of salvation, effectually persuading them by his spirit to believe and obey, and governing their hearts by his word and spirit, overcoming all their enemies by his almighty power and wisdom in such a manner and ways as are most consonant to his wonderful and unsearchable dispensation. Men, you may be seated. We have an opportunity now to confess our sins corporately before our God, and uh, we will use our corporate prayer of confession now uh, to do that. So let's go to God in prayer. O oh, great and everlasting God, who dwells in unapproachable light, who searches and knows the thoughts and intentions of the heart, we confess that we have not loved you with all our heart, nor with all our soul, nor with all our mind, nor with all our strength, nor our neighbors as ourselves. We have loved what we ought not to have loved. We have coveted what is not ours. We have not been content with your provisions for us. We have complained in our hearts about our family, about our friends, about our health, about our occupations, piles. We have sought our security in those things that perish, rather than in you, the everlasting God. Chasten, cleanse, and forgive us through Jesus Christ, who is able for all time to save us who approach you through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. Amen. Hear now these words of assurance of pardon that come from John's first letter. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. These simple but secure words of our assurance of pardon, our salvation in Christ, are ours as we cling uh, to Christ who has nailed our sins to the cross. And because of that, then we can respond to him in singing joyfully blessed assurance. So I invite you to stand as we sing hymn 693, Blessed Assurance. <laughs> Thank you. 
Please be seated. Good morning. Uh, today's reading of the Old Testament will be in Isaiah chapter 41, verses 21 through 29. According to Matthew Henry's commentary, chapter 41 may be summed up in those words of Elijah. If, your God is God, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if you all, then follow him. This passage in the book of Isaiah comes during a time in the life of the people of Judah and Jerusalem where there was an enormous amount of turmoil and uncertainty and upheaval. Just a few chapters earlier, the people were being threatened by an invasion of the Assyrian Empire, Empire, which had invaded and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel many years before. Chapter 41 opens with God speaking to the coastlands, where the nations are all around Jerusalem. And how do they find strength themselves? To, uh, how do they find, how do they, they strengthen themselves? What do these nations do to find the assurance and protection and comfort that everything will be okay? They build themselves as more idols. In verse 21 through 24, God calls the idols worshippers to present their case that things they worship are really gods. The answer to the question is, of course not. Just as a thunderstorm cannot predict where it will go or what it will do, neither can an idol. So God mocks them, daring them to do anything at all. If they cannot do anything good for their worshipers, then perhaps they can do something frightening against their enemies. But there is no answer. So God pronounces judgment. These gods are nothing. Their, work are, their works are worthless. And those who worship them are an offense to creation. In the verses 25 to 27, God responds to the challenge. He does have a plan for history, and what will be unfolding before the exile's eyes will be the evidence of it. God has brought the conqueror who is coming down on Babylon, like a brick maker who jumps into a large container where the clay is and treads it into a liquid form. In verses 28 and 29, is the pronouncement of judgment on the idols and the idol worshipers. They have been unable to give any answer to the question God has asked. There is no one among them who can give an evidence that their gods are even in the same category as Yahweh. He alone is the truly other, and thus he alone is truly God, is truly holy. All who worship something other than the true God are doomed to become like their gods, nothing worthless, wind, and chaos. Their lives are doomed to become meaningless, meaningless as their gods are. So, in page 601, Isaiah chapter 41, verses 29 through, uh, 21 through 29, the futility of idols. Set forth your case, says the Lord, Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are, that, they may, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome, or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Do good or do harm that we may be dismayed and terrified. Behold, you are nothing, you are, and your work is less than nothing, an abomination is he who chooses you. I stirred up one from the north, and he has come, from the rising of the sun, and he shall call upon my name. He shall trample on rulers as on mortar, as the potter treads clay. Who declared, who declared it? from the beginning that we might know, and beforehand that we might say he is right. There was none who declared it, none who proclaimed, 
none who heard your words. I was the first to say to Zion, behold, here they are. I give to Jerusalem a herald of good news. But when I look, there is no one. Among these, there is no counselor. Who, when I ask, gives an answer? Behold, they are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 I invite the ushers forward as we continue to worship with the giving of our tithes and our offerings. that we can rejoice and that we can uh, lift up our voices because you, O oh God, have given us uh, voices to sing your praise. We thank you that you have transferred us from the dominion of darkness into your marvelous light. And now as we render these tithes and these offerings and these gifts to you, we pray that you would use them uh, to bring uh, more into uh, your kingdom, uh, all to the praise of your glorious name and grace. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. (laughs) 
As we turn to a time of prayer now, we move to Psalm 140 as we work our way uh, through uh, the Psalter to frame our prayers of intercession. Psalm 140, written to the choir master, a psalm of David. This is a psalm that is uh, a prayer for protection uh, from evil men and at the same time a prayer of confidence uh, in God uh, to preserve his people. And so we'll use uh, this psalm then to frame our prayers as we go to God. Let's, uh, let's pray. Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their hearts and stir up wars continually. They make their tongue sharp as a serpent's, and under their lips is the venom of asps. Guard me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have planned to trip up my feet. The arrogant have hidden a trap for me, and with cords they have spread a net. Beside the way they have set snares for me. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we can draw near to your throne of grace to lift up our voices in praise and prayer because our Lord Jesus Christ has made a way to your throne through the offering up of his own body. You are great, O God, and greatly to be praised and your graciousness is unsearchable. Therefore, we thank you uh, that your saving concern for us is comprehensive, that we can join with David in asking for your deliverance in this life from evil men. Therefore, we pray that you would deliver and preserve us first uh, through a development of our own discernment. Would we have eyes to see and hearts to discern sharp tongues and venomous lips? Would you give us restraint, even self-control, not to be dragged into the wars that violent men continually stir up? Would you guard us, O Lord, from the hidden traps of the arrogant through your own work of grace in us by your Spirit? Would you renew us after your image and true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness that we might, with wisdom, uh, walk through this world? I say to the Lord, you are my God. Give ear to the voice of my pleas for mercy, O Lord. O Lord, my Lord, the strength of my salvation, you have covered my head in the day of battle. Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the, of the wicked. Do not further their evil plot, or they will be exalted. As for the head of those who surround me, let the mischief of their lips overwhelm them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into fire, into miry pits, no more to rise. Let not the slanderer be established in the land. Let evil hunt down the violent men speedily. Father, we pray also that you would personally protect us, especially from the fiery darts of the devil. Would you be our shield, O God? Would you give us the good sense to put on the helmet of salvation that we may be able to withstand an evil day? More than that, we pray that you would bring to nothing the schemes of the wicked, that your church might flourish in godliness and dignity both here and around the world. Therefore, we do pray for your missionaries whom you have sent to the ends of the earth to proclaim the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh God, that you would be uh, their strength that you would be their shield as they do battle uh, with spiritual forces uh, as they go forth as your uh, ambassadors of the gospel of reconciliation. Uh, would you do more than just protect them? Would you, O oh God, uh, provide uh, a hearing uh, for the gospel as they seek uh, to bring um, the good news of the kingdom uh, to the ends of the earth? I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted, and will execute justice for the needy. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. Father, along with David, we pray these things with the knowledge that whatever might happen to us in this life, we are eternally secure in Christ Jesus our Lord. We know that Christ will always maintain the cause of the afflicted and execute justice for the needy because he himself is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, we rightly give thanks to your name, and we long to dwell forever in your presence. And while we await the coming of your Lord, of our Lord and, and Savior, Jesus Christ, would you make us effective testimonies of the transforming power of your gospel 
and the praise to the praise of your glorious grace. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 We'll invite you to turn to John chapter 19. Though we uh, recognize this as Palm Sunday uh, in our series through John, we are now at the burial of our Lord. Uh, as we are now uh, very conveniently uh, set up to uh, to hear of the resurrection on Easter Sunday. Uh, so that works out really well, and praise God for that timing. Uh, but now, f- before we can get to the resurrection, we must consider uh, his burial. Uh, and one thing that I would like to point out here is that this is not a brief paragraph that we simply skip over in order to get to the good stuff, uh, but it in itself has important things to teach us. Uh, that even in uh, even in his burial, uh, Christ is speaking to us. So I invite you to give your attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word, uh, John chapter 19, verses 38 to 42, uh, found on page 906 of the Blue Church Bible. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, word, this brief word that describes the burial of our Lord. And pray, O God, that you would now speak to us, uh, for your servants are listening. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, some of you know this, most of you don't, but I have some genetic hearing loss. It's not because of rock and roll, (laughs) although I have hearing loss from rock and roll. But this is the genetic one, and so instead of just ignoring that reality, I went ahead and went to the audiologist to, to see just, you know, how bad it is. Do I, at the age of 37, need to wear hearing aids? I don't, obviously. I didn't just reject their advice. Uh, But the experience was interesting. Uh, Because the last time I had gone to get my hearing checked, I think, was the 8th grade uh, school nurse's office. And, you know, they put the big headphones on, and then they do the beeps, and you're supposed to put your hand up and down. Like They they thought there was something wrong with me, because there was something wrong with me, when I never put my hand up every time it was my right ear. That's the way it goes. But now, things were totally different, because it was a room that I walked into, not just some big headphones. As the door was, was shutting to the outside, it was the most eerie experience to be in total silence. And really, th- the most total silence I've ever experienced in my life. You know, even when you're out in the middle of the, the uh, Appalachian Trail, there's still background noise. There's still something that, show, that tells you that, that the world is alive. There's a certain level of background noise that you expect, but when you're in one of these these sound boxes, there's nothing. Your voice makes it this far before it falls to the ground. It's, it's almost an oppressive kind of silence that you experience there because you, you expect some level of background noise to know that, that you're alive, uh, that you're in a world uh, that is alive. So we approach our text this morning. There's something of this, this psychological oppression of silence that you can feel in this text. Jesus is the Word made flesh. You expect to hear something from the one who is named the Word. But you don't hear a single word from the Word. And more than that, in at least half of the, the references to Jesus here, John speaks of Jesus' body which is an even more distanced way of talking about him in this, uh, in this paragraph. 
For the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, we expect to hear something of that general background noise to tell us uh, that we still are in uh, the world. And yet within this palpable silence that's associated with the death of Jesus, there is much non-verbally communicated uh, to us. And it is communicated by and through these two men who take responsibility for the body of Jesus. We might even say that uh, through this nonverbal, their, their actions, they speak, right? And there's a reversal of this silence that then runs as a thread through these verses. So that the, uh, the silence of the grave turns into a loud testimony of the renewal of all things. That indeed began when Jesus of Nazareth said, it is finished, and then gave up the ghost. So as we look at this text this morning, my main idea is this, the silence of the grave speaks volumes about the work of Christ. The silence of the grave speaks volumes about the work of Christ. Our approach to the text will be to lay out three reversals uh, that we can discern here Uh, that in their own way speak out of the silence uh, of Jesus. We can begin here with verses uh, 38 and 39. We see a reversal from fear to courage. A reversal from fear to courage. Look back at verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate, that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. Here we're introduced for the first time in John's gospel, Joseph of Arimathea, and his introduction is quite sudden and and succinct, likely because John is writing his gospel after the others had already been in, other gospels had already been in circulation. He didn't uh, feel like he needed to present who Joseph is. Uh, But just for the sake of rounding out who is Joseph, one commentator summarizes well what we know about Joseph. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, rich, and looking for the kingdom of God. It was this man then, this Joseph, who took possession of Jesus' body after Jesus' death. And remember, it was important that somebody take possession of this body. While the Jewish authorities couldn't have Jesus' body hanging from a tree overnight, that's why they went and they clubbed the, the, uh, the knees of the other two, uh, the, the criminals on either side. They needed them to die so that they could take them off the crosses before nightfall. Uh, it's Deuteronomy 21. Uh, they themselves were not going to take care of this, this traitor's body themselves. Somebody then needed to take this man's corpse Commentators, they know that ordinarily the next of kin would be the one who would then take charge of this uh, body. Uh, But Jesus' brothers, we know, didn't necessarily believe in him at this point. And more than that, when you're talking about a traitor, it's not that simple to go and then ask for a body. Likely, the charge, even if his brothers felt like they could go and get him, had a chilling effect on anyone who would just waltz up to Pilate and ask for the body. So then this question that is uh, underneath this uh, text then is, who is going to take this body? And that's where Joseph of Arimathea, he comes in. And summarizing uh, one commentator's uh, reasoning for why it was Joseph in particular, uh, D.A. Carson says here that Joseph uh, was the one who had the rank as a member of the Sanhedrin, and the, and the wealth uh, to take charge of this body. He had access to Pilate, and he had the means uh, to do something with the body once he received it, even if the next of kin wouldn't or couldn't do the same. And so that explains something of the how of Joseph being able to receive Jesus' body here. But there's still this interesting question that we can also ask, why did Joseph do this? Certainly he had the ability to, but why? 
After all, John in this verse tells us that Joseph was a secret follower of Jesus. And all of that on account of the fear of man. Earlier in John's gospel, he had made a comment uh, to the effect that secret admirers of Jesus were not looked on very highly. And so it is, and it should be, something of a surprise here that Joseph would be introduced as the one then who receives this body as the very one who is a secret admirer, a secret follower of Jesus. And if we add to that the mention of Nicodemus, whom John reminds us, even in these verses, was one of those others who snuck out at night to talk to Jesus. In both of these cases, these men are characterized by fear. So what gives? Why are they then the ones who come and take charge of Jesus' body? Well, it's precisely here then we can see how the silence of the grave begins to speak volumes because Christ's death has done something. It has changed these men. They who were once silenced by their own fear of man are suddenly emboldened to proclaim with their hands, and I should add with their wallets, a devotion to Jesus of Nazareth. If you look At uh, verse 39, Nicodemus then, he comes with 75 pounds of of, um, anointing or burial spices. Now, he's not lugging a a sack of 75 pounds. He's got servants who are helping him in this process. But nevertheless, that's a huge outlay of cash uh, in order to to show his devotion uh, to Jesus. But how strange is it? That these men, who were so fearful when Jesus was alive, now in his death suddenly have the, the courage, the pluck, to show devotion to the Lord. But is it strange? Isn't that kind of why Jesus had to suffer and die? So that then he could change those who are Fearful of man to those who have great courage in the Lord? Isn't the whole purpose of Christ's suffering and death to make us what we're not? And so we have our first reversal here from fear to courage. Now we should acknowledge, and and we don't want to say too much here, If you were a first century journalist covering the Jesus story, if you interviewed Joseph and Nicodemus as they received Jesus' body, there's almost no way that they would have explained their actions according to the confession, Jesus is Lord. As one commentator puts it, this was a deed of love rather than an act of faith. Or to say it another way, their actions did not indicate that they believed that Jesus would rise again. Nevertheless, we must appreciate that even before the resurrection, before the undeniable revelation that Jesus is Lord, God was at work in the renewal of all things, including these formerly fearful men, to change them. That then they would show a devotion to Jesus before they even had the opportunity to confess Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. I think it's worth pausing here just to reflect on this fact that God works on a person before he or she knows it cognitively. Before you're conscious of it, God is at work. I don't think it's beyond the pale to say that Joseph and Nicodemus were effectively compelled by the power of the Spirit, from fear to courage, even if they wouldn't have had the words to describe what they were doing. I mean, we know, I I think I can say this safely, that we know that they didn't sit down and do some mental calculations, weighing pros and cons before then they would take up the body of Jesus and say, this is what we should rationally do. We should take this, this dead man's body and care for it. No, they're deeply moved 
by the death of the Son, who has already said it is finished, and the Spirit is already at work in their hearts and in their wills to be sweetly straightened out, that then they would, according to the definite foreknowledge of the Father, be faithful servants and steadfast witnesses of Christ and the renewing work of the gospel. Of course, after the fact, they would then articulate, they would be able to articulate, Jesus is Lord. But as they did so, they would have said, didn't you feel that when we were taking him down from the, from the cross? God is at work long before we are consciously aware of it. That says a lot, that should say a lot to us about how we think about our own lives, about how we think about raising up the next generation, about how we think about sharing the gospel with those around us, our neighbors, our family, our friends, our coworkers. Now, don't get me wrong, Joseph and Nicodemus, they still needed to confess their faith in the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ so that their deed of love could be understood as a redeemed deed of love. Also, everyone must ordinarily make a public and credible profession of faith in Christ to be reckoned as a full communing member of the body of Christ. These things are ordinarily how God works, but we miss something of the gospel and the work of Christ if we, if we reverse that order. If we begin with a rational confession before we recognize an affective change that so often happens, that even in, even in the youngest in the congregation, they, can, they, they won't be able to explain it, but they are changed by it, the gospel, by Christ himself. I mean, at worst, if we, if we seek only for a confession before then we can say, ah, yes, God is at work, uh, we, are risk, we risk placing ourselves ourselves at the turning point of salvation. And that simply won't do. For it's God who works. It's God who wills and works. Joseph and Nicodemus, they remind us that salvation, the powerful application of God's work, begins with God. And therefore, we baptize babies. Therefore, we catechize children. Not because we think that they're already saved, but because we know that God can work and does go work well before children can then make a credible profession of faith before the church. And so we recognize these things and we operate this way. And the same thing should be true in the way that we deal with adults who are not believers at this moment, who have not made a credible profession of faith, to know that God is at work long before someone says Jesus is Lord. Keep that in mind that God is at work. And in the renewal of all things, he will turn fear to courage before we can say what's going on in our hearts. But moving on here, there's a second and, and here a, a more, uh, I think a briefer reversal in verses 39 and 40. This is from humiliation to exaltation. From humiliation to exaltation. And here in these verses, we have to do with the transition from the lowest point of Jesus' humiliation, now this turning point to his exaltation. In fact, the entombment of, uh, entombment of Jesus, his body, is at the same time an aspect of his humiliation and an aspect of his exaltation, of being lifted up. Of course, your, your point of reference in time uh, it factors into how you see these things. And so we should acknowledge that Joseph and Nicodemus, as for the other disciples, the humiliation of Jesus of, of Nazareth, the Messiah, it certainly would have loomed large at his burial. One theologian reflecting on all this says it well when he writes, Our Redeemer stooped low indeed when he assumed our nature, but lower still when he submitted to be laid in the grave. This is the last degree of humiliation. All the glory of man is extinguished in the tomb. Though he is, 
the Son of the living God, the Lord of heaven and earth, there is nothing now to distinguish him from the meanest of the human race. Or as the preacher in Ecclesiastes puts it, a living dog is better than a dead lion. <laughs> Presents the lowness, the lowest point in humiliation, is suffering the indignity of the Lord of heaven and earth to be laid in a grave. Rock bottom is hit, so to speak, as Joseph and Nicodemus lay Jesus' body in a tomb. But at the same time, and on our side of the resurrection, we also must confess a reversal that begins even here where Christ's exaltation begins as he's laid in the tomb. According to the words of David in Psalm 1610, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One seek corruption. And according to Peter's epic sermon in, in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost, we are on solid ground in saying that even this limp corpse of Christ is exalted on account of his finished work. Calvin comments on on Psalm 1610, and he says this. The question, however, may be asked, as Christ descended into the grave, was he not also subject to corruption? The answer is easy. Tell us, Calvin. The life of Christ will be exempted from the dominion of the grave inasmuch as his body, even when dead, will not be subject to corruption. Besides, we know that the grave of Christ was filled and, as it were, embalmed with the life-giving perfume of the Spirit that it might be to him a gate to immortal glory. Indeed, and he's the first to go that way, and we follow, but that's my next point, so we'll save that for now. <clears throat> now, I, did, I had a, a, a fruitful lunchtime conversation with somebody about this particular discussion. What does it mean that he was you know, exempt from the corruption, from being abandoned to Sheol? Well, exactly what that means that, that Jesus' body did not see corruption, I think it, we, we venture into speculation if we try to apply ourselves too deeply to it. The fact is that we are just like Aaron Burr in Hamilton, and we must confess no one else was in the room when it happened. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Nevertheless, what we can say, I think, is that those spices, those 75 pounds of spices, to have been wrapped in between the, the, the shroud, the, the linen wraps, ordinarily used to cover up the stench of decaying flesh, however it all worked out, instead acted as a, an anointment of this not yet resurrected but still exalted Lord Jesus Christ. There's a turn from humiliation to exaltation even in his burial. As he declares it is finished on the cross, his body can't be abandoned because he has already won the victory. And what remains is for the Lord to show to us through the resurrection that death has no victory, and that the grave is no longer a threat. The resurrection, of course, it matters. We can't say everything about Christ's exaltation Without it, of course, we can't say anything about without it, actually, and we can't say everything here just in his burial. But because Christ was raised on the third day, the whole world was turned upside down when he declared, it is finished. And so even laying his body in a tomb, God shows forth that his weakness is stronger than man's strength. And the foolishness of God is wiser than man. And that means... Even in the silence of the grave, there is much to be said about the powerful work of Christ. For death's strong bands cannot hold him. And then finally, and related uh, to all of that, in verses 41 and 42, we see then that the, there's a, a final reversal from the threat of the grave to its rest. From the threat of the grave uh, to its rest. You know, these verses here, they're, they're simple enough in what they present to us on the face of it. There's no elaborate actions to be taken. It's a, it, 
it's a, a large quantity of spices to be sure, but the, the process itself is, is hasty, uh, for the Sabbath is on coming. It would have begun on sundown on Friday. And so they used what was near at hand. Other Gospels identify this as Joseph of Arimathea's own tomb. Joseph and Nicodemus, they lay Jesus' body down. But there are two seemingly incidental details here that, that take us from a simple description to a suggestive significance. First of all, John notes here in his gospel that it's a garden tomb. The garden imagery is a rich imagery in the scriptures. And I think John clearly wants us to go back to Genesis in the Garden of Eden, that idyllic garden of God in which Adam was first placed, as we think about now uh, what's happening uh, with Jesus. And then second, we'll, we'll kind of pull these things together in a minute. Second, John reminds us once more that the Sabbath, the day of rest, it was coming and coming quickly. And so he's laid in a garden tomb on the eve of the Sabbath. He's in a garden and the Sabbath is coming. As we pull these two images together again, we can't help but look back to Genesis and think about that other garden in which Adam was placed and that first Sabbath on which God in his way rested from his creative work. And there is, of course, a way in which Jesus, who is God incarnate, who is now resting from his labors on that final Jewish Sabbath, as he gets laid down and the sun uh, falls below the horizon, God rests from his work. In fact, Jesus had already declared it. It is finished. And we can, with some reflection, say it was very good. What he declared was finished. He was well within his rights then to rest on the Sabbath. But then we also have to remember he's not only God incarnate, but he's God incarnate. He's the word made flesh. He's not only God who rests from his good work, but he's Adam, the second Adam, in the garden. And in his capacity as Adam, and as we've confessed in our affirmation of faith, as the mediator of a new covenant and a new creation, the work that he has finished fundamentally changes everything. For that first man in that first garden really blew it and brought in curse and condemnation. But the second man, the second Adam, in this garden, he nailed it. And through his obedience, Paul says, he has made many to be accounted righteous. He has reversed the cursed condition of man on account of that first Adam. He's initiated the renewal of all things by undoing and then doing perfectly what no other Adam, no, no other man, woman, or child could do. This tomb then, this grave in this garden is no threat at all to this mediator of this covenant, to this Jesus. In fact, it becomes for him a fitting place as that greater Adam, as the mediator of a better covenant, to take his Sabbath, as it were. Now to take some rest before the dawning of the new age on the Lord's day comes and the new creation breaks into the old. To say it again, Holy Saturday, 
the one of history, not the one that we're going to have next Saturday, right? The one of history. It was, in truth, the last Jewish Sabbath. It was the last six plus one way of thinking about God's world. Because on the first day of the new week, Christ emerged from the tomb in his exalted, resurrected body after his rest. And from that point on, the world now is one plus six. It is from a point of victory and exaltation that then we go forth from the first day of the week uh, through the rest of the week. Because that is what Christ did in his garden on the verge of this last Sabbath. He reverses everything because it is finished. The grave is a resting place for the one who has accomplished all things. What is true for him is true also for everyone who is united to him. No more does the grave need to be seen as a threatening or insatiable monster. It is, in fact, a bed, a resting place, precisely because it is finished. For all those who are united to Christ, those who fall asleep in Christ before he comes again, there's no fear of death. Rather, there is an opportunity to look forward to that day when, when each one who falls asleep in Christ will be raised complete as a new creation with a resurrected body and a perfected soul. Silence of the grave speaks volumes about Christ's work as he rests here. For he makes the ferocious and fearful wolf of death into a playful puppy. If we have faith to receive it. Again, we only know this is true because the resurrection actually happened. If you were still in the grave, we'd have nothing. But on the third day. He rose from the dead. Therefore, we know that it is true that death has no hold over those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we can hold on confidently to this encouragement. The grave has no threat. That it is nothing to be feared. But is rather a resting place. Until Christ is all, until God is all in all. As a balm and a comfort. And it ought to be what we then share with those who are facing the grave. To remind them, if they are in Christ, that this dark river can be forded. In the end, I hope my hope here is that we don't take Christ's burial as an inconvenient stoplight before we get to the resurrection and we celebrate with Uh, with Easter Sunday. For even in his burial, what I've tried to present is that even now, he's reversing all things as Joseph and Nicodemus lay him in the grave. The time between his last breath in the flesh and his first breath in the resurrected body is more than just a historical fact that we, we just acknowledge and then plunge headlong into Easter Sunday. If nothing else, the sight of Jesus' lifeless body set something in motion for Joseph and Nicodemus that they couldn't explain, uh, but was definitely a change in them. If nothing else, Christ's resting in the grave provides us with great comfort that where he has gone and come out, uh, we may go and come out too. I want to close here just to commend to you the value of meditating on death. But don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying I want you to have some sort of unbalanced interest and investigation into death and the afterlife. Don't do that. In the, uh, in the reflection, I put some, some good words from, uh, from my favorite dead Dutch author, Herman Bovink, about the, the limitations that we have placed upon us about what it looks like uh, you know, post death, right? What is the what's typically called the intermediate state? 
what does it look like to be a disembodied soul? Well, you can't see it, so you can't really talk too much about it. And scripture is very reserved about what exactly it says. Nevertheless, what we can we can say some things. We can say a few things about it. And what we can say uh, about death on, on this side of the whole disembodiedness is that we have something that we can do with it. If the threat, the fear of the grave has been rendered uh, to be um, a dull knife rather than a sharp razor, then we can treat it. We can handle it. We can get to know it a lot safer uh, in that way. Meditate upon death in light of Christ's death, in light of Christ's resurrection. Hear these words from Bavink, his helpful thoughts on this topic. He says, Spiritual life is first made perfect in death and then moves over to eternal life. We need to prepare for death, familiarize ourselves with it, and count our days. With his death, Christ has broken the power of death and Satan and set free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. A Christian who hears Christ's word and believes him has eternal life and will not be judged, but is crossed over from death to life. Meditating on death, then, is useful for us to humble ourselves, to help us set aside imagining a long life. Bavink said it, I didn't say it. To take away the strength and fear of death, and so on. We are to face death each day, but after the cross, death is less. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone, but we live. Or if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Those are Paul's words, not Bobbing's. Let's then give an ear to the silence of the grave. Meditate on death properly, knowing that death has no sting and the grave is no threat, precisely because our Lord has gone first, and he's brought life out of it for all those who believe in him. There is hope, dear brothers and sisters. Let us take the long view that sees death as a momentary separation of body and soul and give all glory to the one who has conquered death in himself. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that we can uh, boldly look at death uh, with, without fear and knowing that Christ has gone before us. Uh, Father, we acknowledge uh, that uh, death still has, dying uh, particularly, still has uh, great challenges uh, for us to face. Uh, but would you, O oh God, provide us with the strength to see uh, the beauty of how you, O oh God, uh, preserve us uh, through the end. And when we don't know, and when we struggle, would you help us in our unbelief and give us the grace uh, to look to Christ as our only strength and hope. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our hymn of response, hymn 260, Were You There?
be seated. The answer, answer to that spiritual is yes. We were there. For Paul tells us that when Christ died, we died with him. And that when Christ was raised to new life, we were raised with him. It is a mystery uh, for he who is above and outside of time uh, to draw us into his saving work. Uh, but we were there. For we who have been brought into the body of Christ, united to him by his spirit, were there when he was laid in the grave and when he rose up from the dead. The hope that we have is not in some abstract historical artifact, but in the living Christ, to whom you have a living fellowship even now. And he provided us this table to encourage us with our eyes as he speaks to us in nonverbal ways here as well, that he is the source of our strength and our hope and our salvation. So he invites us then to come and to taste and see that he is good. Just as we are united to him in his death, just as we are united to him in his life, in his resurrection, we are united to him in his ongoing, exalted ministry. And as we participate in this sacrament that signs that, uh, we are sealed in our participation in the full, overflowing life of our Savior. Come, be strengthened by your living Lord as you receive these signs of your participation in his life. We do use uh, wine. Uh, if for reasons of diet or conscience you prefer juice, uh, you can find it in the outer rings of the drink trays. If you require gluten-free bread, you'll find it in small bags in the bread trays. Uh, these elements are for those who have confessed that Jesus is Lord, who have made a public profession of faith and admitted to this table, not CPC's table, not the PCA's table, but Christ's uh, table. If you've been admitted, then come and taste and see. If you have not, then consider. And consider who Christ is. That in his death, he has renewed all things. Speak to me or one of the other elders about the gospel. We would love to declare it to you. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, uh, this visible word in this sacrament uh, that strengthens us uh, and indeed is uh, your grace to us as we are united uh, to your Son. Uh, would you, O oh God, strengthen us uh, in, your, in our mystical union with Christ as we taste and see and receive uh, this word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
On the night when the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's go to God in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all thanks and praise for the abundance of your uh, grace uh, to us and for these, uh, this sacrament, uh, for your uh, proclamation uh, through this uh, visible word uh, of our uh, security and our participation in the Lord Jesus Christ, who would give of himself entirely uh, that we might have life in him. We praise you, O God. Uh, for your salvation, and we pray uh, that you would uh, continue uh, your work of renewal uh, in our hearts and in this world, the praise of your glorious grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn, hymn 237, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty.
Remember the Lord bless you and keep you. Uh, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, let me just highlight a couple announcements here. A reminder that our Good Friday service is this coming uh, Friday, March 29th at 7 p.m. Please join us uh, for uh, that uh, service. Uh, one more opportunity to reflect on uh, the death of our Savior before we return on Sunday uh, to give glory uh, for his resurrection. Uh, we will have a sunrise service at... 6.30 at the church in the parking lot, uh, weather permitting. Uh, so, uh, so sunrise service, uh, Elder Morris is, uh, is taking point on that one, 6.30 here at the church. Uh, then we will have, in lieu of Sunday school, a, um, a fellowship breakfast. Please do sign up uh, in the foyer to join us um, for that at 9.15. And then uh, we, will, uh, we will worship our risen uh, Lord and King thereafter. I do want to make uh, one point about next week's uh, kind of the, the logistics b leading up to the service. Uh, I love eating breakfast. I love eating breakfast with you guys. Uh, we are generally much later in, in getting things organized when we eat breakfast uh, here for the service, uh, but the choir has done a lot of practice. Uh, we are going to have a, a prelude, a specific prelude, uh, kind of to set the tone of the of the worship service. Uh, and so we're going to try to to be as diligent as we can to clean up early, uh, and actually sit, uh, be be seated, and be ready uh, for the worship of our God for the prelude. Uh, now we're going to do our best to help with that by giving you a pre-prelude, <laughs> and I'll even come up here, and I'll probably welcome you, uh, but, uh, you know, do your best as well to be here on time. Uh, if you're not going to be here for the, uh, for the breakfast, uh, then at least, you know, seek to be here five minutes early, uh, which would be 1025, um, so that we can all uh, enjoy the musical gifting that God has given to uh, the many people who are uh, friends and members of this church. Uh, so there's my logistical plea to be, uh, to be here. And then in the event that we have uh, family and friends coming to visit, uh, also be mindful of, of how much space you have between uh, you and the next uh, kind of unit in the, in the area, particularly I'm looking at y'all here. Just get comfortable. You're doing a pretty good job. Like that row right there, I'm really proud of y'all. <laughs> Very close. <laughs> good job. That's what we should be doing, uh, smush, smush in, <laughs> so that when people inevitably do come late, uh, they have a place to go and don't have to step over anybody in order to do so. Uh, and you guys, you know, smush out, right? You're gonna squeeze that way. Uh, and then, that then the aisles can be uh, left clear. Okay, uh, so there's our annual plea for, for decency and order uh, as we go to uh, our, <laughs> our Easter service. Uh, don't also, also don't forget that we are going to have a, um, a deacon's fund offering. Uh, uh, Easter is a fifth Sunday, and, and we're going to then keep to our tradition of, of collecting a deacon's fund uh, offering uh, after service as well. Um, okay, uh, men's and women's reading groups uh, continue on. If you are, uh, if you're, so what week is this? This is the women's week, am I right? Yeah, okay. Um, let me encourage you, uh, the, if you haven't been a part of those and if you are interested in doing so, now is just as good a time as any uh, to go ahead and make the commitment uh, to be a part of it because, because all of it is, is kind of leading us then into a, a, a church-wide thing uh, in September. And so you know, getting the habit now of setting Wednesdays aside, I think it would be really great for everybody in the church to be getting the habit now. Uh, to be ready for it. And particularly, let me just make a, a plea, if you can be in person uh, for the women's group, please do so. Um, 
it just makes it for a richer conversation uh, for people to be in person, as, as difficult as it might be. Uh, um, so there you go. That's, that's all I'm going to say on that. Uh, please, please think about if you can uh, participate in these things. I think it is a rich way of growing in your, in your discipleship and your love of, of Christ. Okay, now I think I'm done. And there are palms in the back uh, in light of uh, Palm Sunday, which is weird because I just did the death, but, you know, <laughs> that's the way it goes. Okay, you're dismissed. Thank you.